Uh, Kevin, yeah, I'm yeah. here, I'm here. Yeah, okay, Gerald is here. And um, we, are, we have Azaria, who's going to also take us through a section of today's tutorial, and then I'm going to handle the last bit of the tutorial. Uh, so Gerald, um, can you introduce yourself um, to the Batch 4 cohort? Um, tell them how Batch 3 was. <laughs> uh, tell them if it was a good teammate in the same group uh, for one of the week's challenge. So yeah, uh, just introduce yourself and let them know what, okay, what, you, okay, what you've been okay. working on. So I'm Ger I'm Gerald. Uh, Kevin, I can see Kevin was my colleague in batch three and a very good friend of mine. We only disagree when it comes to football teams. Uh, I can see also Lawal has joined. Uh, Lawal, we're also with him in batch three. So yeah, oh, also Anastasia is here. So like, it's fun meeting for that, I know, and it's a pleasure meeting all of you. Uh, at the moment, um, what can I say? I'm an intern at some company here in Kenya uh, called Revolution Analytics. Uh, besides that, I love to code. I, li I love going to the gym, love going hikes, and uh, yeah. And today I'll take you guys through Docker. Now, so that's it for me. I don't know what else to say about me. Yeah, okay. Um, um, for some reason, I think I have. Can you hear? Uh, yeah. Uh, for some reason, I have too many applications installed. Uh, open. Let me close a few. It's sort of lagging on my end. Yeah. So Azaria, um, can you introduce yourself to the cohort uh, for the guys who don't know you? Yeah. Um. Hi everyone. Um. I'm a batch four trainee. Uh. And I'm going to be. Hello everyone. For <laughs> those who know me and don't, I'm going to be taking you through a section of uh, the Docker technical tutorial. Looking forward. Uh, what do you do? Well, I'm a trainee <laughs> right now. I'm a trainee. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Sure. Cool. Um. So yeah, Gerald, uh, you can start with the first session. Uh, the first section. Okay. I think I'll start. Let me share my screen. Uh, don't worry that I have so many tabs open. That's just I never close my tabs because. If I close them, it's always another problem starting to like finding them. They always have something important. Okay. I also enjoy sitting on the floor, so don't worry about that too. So uh, on my side, I'll take you guys through some just some basics of Docker. What is Docker? How Docker was? How life was before Docker? And then uh, yeah, and then I'll leave for Azaria and. Kevin to take over. Okay, so let me know as soon as you can see my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yes. we can. Yes, yes we can. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with Docker. So just to mention there was, there was life before Docker. So I'm assuming that most of you guys have already gone through this. You've gone to on the Docker website. Uh, downloaded Docker, created an account, you have an Heroku, VS Code, you, you use VS Code or, and then you already have the VS Code Docker extension. So to start, I'll go back in time. So how was live with, without Docker so that you can just understand what problem Docker is solving? So imagine this, so I wish I could, just a minute. I wish I could see you guys. So, yeah. Imagine we have, let me pick a random person from the chat. So we have, we have Mubarak and then we have uh, Stacy. So imagine we have both uh, Stacy and Mubarak working on some project within our, within the company and they were supposed to deliver. So what happens is that this is Mubarak's machine, this is Stacey's mas machine. So when Stacey she, like de develops an application or like he's doing the, her software, and then he sends that work to Mubarak so that Mubarak can like have a look at it and sort of test it. Then Mubarak will be like, oh, it doesn't work on my, my machine. But Stacey is like, this works on my machine. So I don't know how to solve that. And then they have to come down, sit, sit again and start troubleshooting those issues so that it's able to work on 
this second laptop that runs on a different operating system. So this is so you can imagine doing that for the whole team within the environment. It works on my my my, my computer. It doesn't work on your computer. Then that's the first challenge that was there before. Then the other thing was that you have the development environment where you are testing your applications and you also have the production environment. You built your software, yet now you want to push your software into production or to host it on a server so that it can be used. So you find that it still works on your computer, but when you push it to the server, you start getting errors. So that was a major challenge. So you'd have to spend time trying to troubleshoot those specific errors on the server because you're sure it works. Sometimes you even have to downgrade or upgrade uh, the whole package or like the operating system and stuff like this, which was a lot of work. You can imagine doing that for so many different applications that you are, you are going to deploy. So the solution that was proposed was the use of virtual machines. So how do this work? So you have your laptop. Your laptop has an operating system. So on top of this operating system, you create, you install a virtual machine like uh, managing software such as VirtualBox. So there's VirtualBox, then there are, not, there are so many nowadays. So with this VirtualBox, you then now create, a, what can I say, a virtual operating, a, a virtual computer within your computer. On this virtual computer, you can have it running Windows, Linux, and then a Mac. So what people used to do was that if our production server was running on Ubuntu, let's say Ubuntu 18.04, or any or the specific Linux distribution, they'd create a virtual box, a virtual machine that matches the same operating system as the server. And then now you do your development here, and then if it works here, there's a, there are higher chances that it will work on this server. So your virtual machine will have the operating system, the environment, the IDE, your code, and the requirements for that particular code of yours. But this approach was resource intensive. You can imagine for your code, it had to now run back on this operating system. And then VirtualBox had to take whatever is in this uh, virtual machine and convert it to what this, uh, what the mother operating system on in your laptop or your computer can understand. and. Uh, this was resource intensive because now you have to share RAM, you have to share the processing power, you also have to share storage. So if you didn't have like a super powerful computer, this could not work. This was a major challenge. Then now Docker came along. So what is Docker? So Docker is a program that uh, it carves your computer into, into sealed containers. So what does that mean? It means that with Docker now, you are able to like compartmentalize your, uh, your development environment. And then once you like have them in some sort of compartment, you can be able to transfer that compartment to somebody else. And if they have Docker, they can then run your application. So how does how is Docker able to achieve that? So you can say a doc, Docker is just a client program that you can run from the terminal. It's sort of like a server. So it, since it manages all those different appli applications, and then the only other thing is that Docker is not a virtual machine. So it doesn't, it's not, running it is not as computationally expensive as running a virtual machine. Then uh, this is how Docker works. So when you install Docker, Docker creates this abstraction. It's called, uh, called a Docker engine between your operating system and your various applications that you want to run. So what does this doc? So what are these abstractions that are up here? So if you, let's say you are building an application, one that uses Python three, it runs on Ubuntu eighteen, it has like uh, other requirements, and you have a specific IDE that you are using. So you'd you'd have that in something called a Docker, a Docker container. A Docker image, it's, it's a Docker image. I'll explain the difference between a container and an image later. So you host that here on your Docker engine and you're just able to run it. And this process is not as resource intensive as using the virtual machines. So you could have multiple, uh, uh, you could have multiple applications running on this Docker engine. Sometimes they can even share resources. They can even communicate with one another. So this is what Docker, brought to the table. It, it found a way of like 
being able to shape your application the way it is with the exact requirements, the exact operating system to somebody else so that they can run it or to a production server and it will just run it the way it is. Uh, so what are images in Docker? So what you see here, what you see here, this is called a container. A container can be thought of a running instance of an image. So when let's say you are building an API, I'll show with a demo. Let's say you are building an application. So this is going to, you are building an application. Uh, let me just switch screens and go to PyCharm. I usually use PyCharm a lot, so don't worry. So there's this application. It's uh, it's an API, it has no front end, it just uh, serves data. So what this application was doing was that it uh, calculates the similarity between the similarity score between two given sentences, and then outputs this uh, output, sends it to an API and sends the output. So with this application, if I have this application, what I do, when, when I'm running this application, I'd have a container. If I edit this app, if I edit that container and like add more features to it or more requirements to it, I am able to save it as an image, just the same way you have operating system images. So what you're seeing now running on top of here is a container, is a container, the first container, the second container, and the third container. And then once I'm done with my work, I can save it as an image and I can th then send that to somebody else and they can build on top of that. So here we have the images. So it makes up just enough of the operating system required to run your application. You can have a lot of images in a single computer. So like you can have, you can save, you could be editing the container, you have a version one then you save it as an image, then you have a version two, you save it as another image and then like that. And then because some, uh, they can become large, images are designed to be composed of layers of other images, allowing minimum amount of data to be sent when transferring images over the network. So like, instead of having one big image, like you guys were saying, like sometimes they, somebody just mentioned that uh, they had an image file that was almost like four GB in size and then they can't run it even downloading it is a problem. So you can break them down into smaller images that you can always sort of use. So as I said, a container now is a running instance of an image. So it contains the configuration files, it contains your code, the processes that are supposed to run, the dependencies, the operating system that your application uses and how the network that it, it uses. So container, so container is just an instance of an image as I've mentioned. So I'll just show a demo of a container instance. So in this application, so this is my code. It's just a Flask API. So this is the, the API and how it works with the classes and everything like that. And then I have this Docker file. As you can see, I went, I just tell it, this is the image that I'm going to use. This image was downloaded from Docker Hub. Uh, I think more of this will be shown in the later part of the tutorial. And then I tell it my working directory. So where the path as to where, uh, the, uh, the path to where like my application is for, in this case, it's, it's in the web. Uh, so I was supposed to change this to web, but it's okay. So I tell you to have my application, in my, oh, my app, here is my app. So once it goes to home, it will find the app.py. Then here I have my requirements file. So my requirements file are currently here. So I, I take this requirements file and I copy them to the working directory. And then I tell it that I want it to install my requirements.txt. So when it installs the requirements.txt, it will take my requirements exactly as they are and then use it to build this container. I then copy everything. So since I've already created my requirements for TXT, I have my working directory. I then just tell it to like copy whatever is in this directory to this. I don't know how I'll explain this to this current working directory. I don't know whether that makes sense, but that's just how it does it. 
And then after that, I want you to run this program. So Python, so the, I'll use Python, run Spacey, and then download this model from uh, the Spacey website, because it's an NLP sort of model. These are the commands that I want to run. So I want to run the command Python app.py. So I'm telling it to run this command Python to run this application. So this is just a container. So it just details the steps that I need so as to run my application. So this is the Python image I downloaded from Docker Hub. And then these are, these are the steps that I'm taking to run uh, my application right now. Once I'm done with this, once this is done running and I decide now to save this work, I'll create my own image now that I can share with everyone that already has the image that I downloaded from Docker Hub and the changes that I have made to that specific container. Uh, so uh, if I go back to the slides, so what I was just trying to illustrate is that you could have a Docker image. When you run it, it becomes a container when you're running it. You can edit it here or you can run it the way it is. Once you, you, you finish with it, you can then exit. If you exit, it's stopped and then it's now an image. So you then push it to Docker where it now becomes sort of like a new image. The only thing you have to note mostly when creating these files is that it, even if there's something like a slight space like this, it will bring issues with the Docker. So it has to be like no spaces. Just check on the Docker website on how to create the Docker file and follow the exact specifications because it normally has issues. Then the other thing when creating and managing your containers, this, this uh, option here from pip. So what this option does is that if in case, when you whenever you install a file via pip, it's able to like save to memory uh the work uh the image like it will save to memory if you downloaded like let's say tensorflow it installs and then keeps a copy of it in the memory so that when you install again it doesn't have to do the downloading part so what no what this normally does is that you end up having a docker file that's very large in size so once you add this option it will reinstall everything in the requirements file but it won't con into it won't it won't cache them or like create a memory instance of them. So meaning that I'll have a Docker image that's that has a reduced size whenever I save this image. So I think with that I'd finish with I'd finish at that unless there are any questions for me or I don't know if we'll go through and then we'll have the questions later. So that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Gerald. Uh, are there any questions or if you have any questions, maybe we can save them at the end of the video once we're done with everything that you have today uh, to cover in this particular section. Um, so Azaria, you're up. Thanks, Gerald. Thanks again. Welcome. Okay. Uh, um, one moment, uh, let me share my screen. So you can see my screen, right? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so um, if anyone has gone to the the two the the GitHub uh, repo that has been shared, um, you can find two files. Um, these two files are um, are things we don't have to worry about for today, but um, one of those files, the Docker Hub deploy.yaml, um, it is going to take our source code that we have on GitHub and it is going to push an image into Docker Hub. Um, and the second one, uh, the Heroku deploy.yaml file, um, it is going to take our source code from GitHub and deploy our web applications. Um, so if we go to the code now, 
um, and we actually see um, we've seen that we've seen Gerald um, actually show the process um, of how a Docker file is generated. And I'm going to show you how um, VS Code actually makes it really easy for us um, to generate our Docker file. Um, so I'm going to assume everyone has the Docker extension for VS Code installed. Um, so what we do is we go to the command palette, um, Control Shift P on Windows. Um, command shift P on Mac, I'm not sure. Um, so when we go to that and we type in Docker, um, we get the option of adding Docker files to the workspace. Um, so um, we have here like a simple Flask application with just a single route, um, which returns um, hello Flask in Docker. Um, so if we type in Docker and we add Docker files to the workspace, um, VS Code gives us this option of choosing uh, what our application is and um, what kind of Docker file um, that we actually want to generate. Um, so the application that we're using is a, is a Flask application. So we choose Flask um, and we choose our entry point. So the entry point is our app.py. Um, so that is um, where our application is going to be served. Um, so we choose add app.py and which port that uh, we want our application to listen to. Um, so we can uh, leave this to 5,000 or um, Heroku actually listens at um, 33,507, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it also gives us the option to include Docker Compose files, um, which we do not want for this demo. Um, so just like that, um, VS Code has generated um, an entire Docker file for us. Um, so we now have a Docker file, which means we can, we don't have to run this application um, just normally. We can run this as a Docker application. And to do that, we will go to the run and debug section found right here inside in our VS code. And we're served with this option of uh, serving our Flask application. So when we run it, um, this is going to run our Flask application on the port that we specified, and we'll be able to see um, our Flask app in the in the browser. Um, so it is coming up. Uh, yeah. So we're taken to the debug console, and hello Flask in Docker. So we now have our web application um, running inside of uh, inside of Docker. Um, so just like that, in a couple of, in, in a minute or two, we're able to do that. Um, so uh, like uh, when we talk about container registries, um, there are places where everyone can uh, share images uh, and actually develop on that, um, like Jared has um, stated before. So um, what Docker Hub does is just like GitHub helps store our source code, um, Docker Hub actually Docker app actually stores uh, images for us. Uh, so um, that is what this deploy is going to do. Uh, this Docker hub deploy.yaml. Uh, so um, I'm guessing everyone has already added the secrets into their GitHub account. Um, so let us actually change this part um, and deploy to Docker hub. Uh, so if we go to hub.docker.com, and we go to the Docker tutorials, we have an empty repository here. Um, so we'll copy this part from our Docker Hub um, and actually uh, actually add it in here, um, just like this. Um, and we can go back into the terminal, uh, into our bash terminal. Um, and actually push this to GitHub. And this is supposed to deploy our app, to deploy our image inside of uh, Docker Hub. Uh, so I'm inside of the main branch. I'm, I'm going to simply git push. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I haven't added the changes that I've made. Uh, so we've added the Docker file, um, the Docker ignore, and the change to the Docker Hub deploy uh, Um So once we've pushed this, 
um, we're actually going to see that it, this actually fails. Um, if we go into the main branch, um, and we wait for our action to run. And this is going to take a couple of seconds. So as a for explanation, you are running both uh, Docker Hub YML and the Heroku YML files as GitHub Actions, right? Um, yes. Uh, so that's ones, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so the Docker Hub, uh, I fixed the Docker. So the changes that we've made here was to push to the Docker Hub. Um, so we started off with an empty Docker Hub repository inside of this Docker tutorial. Um, yeah, and so now we have uh, this image that has been deployed into Docker Hub. So anyone who actually wants to build on this or um, wants to use this can simply um, just use this command um, and instead of push Docker pull and they will have um, the image that you've built um, within their local computer or anywhere that they want it to run. Um, so like we now have an image that we can actually share. Um, and the next one is the Heroku deploy.yaml. Um, so for this, um, we're going to create um, a Heroku application. Um, and inside of our Heroku application, um, we want we, we simply want to deploy our Heroku application. Uh, so that is what this Heroku deploy.yaml is going to do. So what is the name of our Heroku app? Uh, the name is uh, this some unique name 1999 application that was created. Um, and the email of the Heroku account that you used to create uh, the Heroku application. Um, so the email I used was uh, this email. Um, so once we've fixed this Heroku deploy.yaml, uh, fix this Heroku deploy. Um, and Um, yeah, and we go back into our action. Mm. Yeah, we're going to see that both are running and um, the Heroku action should actually pass. Um, and that will deploy our application um, on Heroku. Um, um, I think until it deploys, um, Kevin, you can go on. Maybe. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah. yes, let's see. Um, so this this um, Azaria has taken us through deploying an app on on Heroku, uh, de deploying a Docker app on Heroku, and deploying it as well in the Docker Hub uh, registry. So, but somewhere else in your team or somewhere. Somebody who's anywhere in the world can access your Docker image. Um, so yeah, we just have to define a .yml file. So um, I'm going to take you um, on a part that shows, just share my whole screen. Okay, what's going on? Let me try that again. Okay, for some reason, um, 
my screen disappears. Let me just open Firefox and join from there. Give me a minute. Uh, so, yeah, I'm in. Need this. Okay. Um, so, let me share my screen. Oh, cool. You all can see my screen, right? Let me see if I can see my screen. Yeah, I can see my screen. So <laughs> um, we're good. Uh, so I'm going to take you through the Docker Compose bit. Um, you guys have seen how to deploy a Docker and how to build a Docker, a Docker file, basically, and a container. Now, a Docker Compose sort of takes all of this to the next level, uh, where it ensures that, let's say, you have to build OK, the first step, building a Docker Compose config file, you have to create a Docker Compose config file. And this is usually called this, like docker-compose.yml. And the purpose of this, or how you, you build one actually, is you have to split your app into services. Um, let's say you have a project. Uh, for example, the, the project that I have here, we have the .api, we have the web app, we have the integration test. This does the test. We have the so-called CI. And yeah, basically those, those, are, those are the services that we do. Think of, of the service as something that does a particular task. For example, let's say you have um, the backend. Let's take last week's challenge where we had the backend, right? Um, where the data is coming from, where basically where everything happens and you communicate to the database and the front end sort of uh, communicate to the server, the backend and the, and the backend communicates to the the database to get your data or the data warehouse, the data, the data lake. So if you split up your app into different services where you have one, one particular service that does one particular task, uh, you can create a Docker file for each single one of them. Uh, for example, if we go into the dot API here, the API file, and we go into the directory here, we can see that we have our particular Docker file. And this Docker file is just as what um, Gerald and Azaria ha have defined in their illustrations and in their sections, which is just a normal Docker file that you have. And you can see once you go into the web up here, we also have another Docker file. So for each of your services, if you're going to use Docker Compose, for each of your particular services, it should be in a folder, and that particular folder should have its own Docker file. And once you've created those, you can expose the port, you know how to create them. And an advantage of using Docker Compose is you can build images individually or you can pull them. For example, in our Docker Compose file, the ones that we have here. Where is it? Here we go. The one that we have here. You can see that we are borrowing from different services. Our Redis is some sort of database um, that allows communications. It's, it's a database, basically. And you can see that we've exposed the port here. We have another Postgres database. This might hold, uh, let's say, each particular bit. Um, has different data. So you have data data for the backend, which might be run and will be run with Postgres. And we have the Redis, which maybe holds the front end database or some other aspect of the data where you, or a backup actually for your data, where if something happens to the, to the Postgres server, you can have Redis that runs and your data will be available despite of what happens with the app. We can also define storage. Now these are different services for this particular app where you can call each particular service um, in another service. For example, we can see that in the web app, this is the web app here, the web service, um, we've built from the .api. This means it, it has been built from this particular Docker file that we had in the API service. And once we come to, you know, the web app doesn't call it, but you can see here, yeah. For example, this test CI, this is the one that does testing for the app to see whether it runs really well. We, we have defined this Docker file, and you can see it calls the web app service. This is the front end of our particular app that has been built in Node.js. 
think you can see. And the beauty of Docker is that it allows you to build with different technologies. You know that Node requires a, it requires its own server, and the API here has been built using Flask. And you can see now that Slack, now this particular Docker file will be its own server, and they all can communicate together. But that's getting ahead of our, of myself. Came here. So Docker Compose re revolves around a config file called the Docker Compose. In this, we define all our services of our, as I've shown you before. And you can think as a service as a part of the application, a database or a server, for example. In the Docker Compose, you can configure both your own images and pull images from the Docker direct from the Docker registry. Uh, this uh, web app here is an image that I've built for myself. And you can see that I've defined the Docker file in that particular app. And this particular image, the red is here, and the Postgres SQL, the DB here, and even the storage I've pulled from the Docker registry. So it gives you freedom to pull an image from the Docker registry or build one for yourself. And um, yeah, as I said before, adding your own images requires you to define your own Docker file for your various services. And all of our services rely on an image, which we can create a container. Yeah, and spinning up a container may have different options. Like you can define, let's go back to the Docker Compose file that you have here. You can see that, uh, for example, this .api, um, the Flask app that you have over there, um, has different options where you can specify the, the ports. You can link the DB here. The DB sort of links the different services that you want to use. The ports, you know, expose which particular server your application will be running. And since the docker is sort of like a container, I think of it as a computer, or as Gerald explained before, some sort of virtual environment that you have inside. And once you expose this particular port 500, in order for you to access um, the code that is running inside there, you also have to make sure that that particular container, the web container in this case, exposes port 800. So we have the, uh, I mean, port 5000, we have the input port, this is the port of Flask, and you have the output port, which you can access that particular app. We can also define the environment. I think of the environment as keys and unique environment variables that you'd require for your application to run. Let's say you have a sensitive file that you want to pass in. You can use the environment here to define that particular environment variable, and you can call it inside, um, inside the application. For example, you can do, where was that particular section? Nope, not that. Ah. I, I don't know if I can find it right now. Roots. Okay, so yeah, it, it's going to take a bit of time for me to find it. An environment variable in in Python where you can do os dot get this particular environment. Once you define you've defined an environment variable here in your Docker web app, you can basically call it the same way. It's going to be passed into your particular program and you can call it and use it however you desire. Uh, so that covers the bit about configuring the environment variables. And the best thing about the Docker Compose is because since everything is sort of under one roof, where it all falls in one particular package or in one particular computer, you can enable communication via the various notebooks, where this particular notebook can talk uh, not notebook, this particular container can talk to the other container here in the web app. You can see that and these are the volumes. The volumes are sort of like storage devices. Think of this like a hard disk or where your code is stored and or a backup for your whole system where if you don't want to lose any data, you can store a volume where this data is passing inside. And if you want to get the data out, yeah, you can call that particular volume and the data is going to be there for you as always. You can see in this particular case for the web app here, we've defined the dot web app first slash dot web app as the volume for our data. So if our data was or in any, if anything happened to a container or let's say the communication broke down and the container failed, you can have backup for your data in this particular volume. And once you rerun the, you rerun the container or you rerun the image, you're going to get your code working there as you left it before. I was explaining networking, yes. Uh, so we can see in this particular port, for example, the web integration service, which is built up on the web app. And we have a command. This is basically a Node.js command and the volumes. And you can see that you specify the ports. Now, for every single service in here that is running, 
you can see, for example, the web integration. Let me show you a, a good case. We have the best the web integration up here. Uh, the web integration service I've shown you. And then you can see once you go to the Cypress service, we can see that the Cypress base URL is http.webintegration port 3000. So you can see now this particular Cypress service will communicate with the web integration service and they are all going to run together. And that's that's basically what Docker Compose does. It enables you to have different parts of your particular program or your particular project. And each particular project is going to have its own service. And inside that particular service, just think of it as a, its own container. And these containers can communicate with each other and talk to each other in such a way that the whole system works seamlessly. And you just need to get one particular Docker image. Uh, for example, yeah, the whole if this particular image was pushed to the Docker registry, but this one would be too large because it has so many moving components. But if somebody had a copy of this particular image, they'd just be able to come and run Docker Compose app um, or Docker Compose build. And all of this is going to run simultaneously and you're going to get your service that is working as intended. So that was my brief section on the Docker Compose. Uh, yeah, most application use environment variables. This is just like sort of an explanation of what I've done, of what I've explained using the code. And these containers can communicate to each other through their own internal network. Uh, think of it as a VPC, for example, you had in last week's challenge, where you can only see the things in that particular network. Uh, and they cannot communicate with anything outside. But it's going to be easier for them to communicate because they you just need to expose a port and call the port in another service definition and you can run it as you want. Okay, so that sort of um, finishes my section on the Docker Compose bit. And if you have any question, please free, feel free to ask. Uh, now is the time for questions. Or if there's a bit that you didn't, I ex maybe I explained too fast or you didn't sort of get what I was trying to get at, you can ask a question and I'll expound it and get back to it. Oh, yeah, policy. Yeah, we'll share the. Actually, let me just share it here. Maybe as a way, you can change the permissions for the docs, uh, or you can let me know. You can change the position. For, you can change the permissions for the docs so that I can share with the rest of the members, and they can go through it later and sort of get the pointers on what it entails. Um, I've, I've changed it. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Now let me just share share it with you guys. So, am I sensing no questions? Come on, guys. Where are the questions at? Okay, Zelalem, go ahead. Okay, so uh, the first thing is that uh, when building, mm -hmm. normally there is like, uh, if you download an OS, there will be an image file. So when yeah. you build, will it be, can we only push it to the Docker Hub or can we have it in our local system? Does it build the, the image directly in the folder where you have wow. the Docker once, file? Well, once you do the Docker Compose, no. Once you do the Docker, okay, well, we'll share the video as well, better cat. Well, once you go, once you do Docker build, this is just basically going to run your, your the code that you have in your local machine. Uh, think of the container as everything that you have, the code that you've written in that particular directory. Um, sort of having its own OS underneath and its own, like, what's it called, divided bit of OS under it so that it can run that particular app. So actually, the, the Docker image itself is just those particular files that you have, the code that you've written, and the services or the, ne the necessary OS components to run that particular code. So what oh. you push, what, yeah, what, what you push to, to the, to the Docker registry is those particular comp pushed over there so that now anybody can just call it and run it. Does that make sense? Yes, somewhat. So uh, for example, if I use a Linux and uh, mm -hmm. pushed an image mm -hmm. and you download it, uh, let me say you use Mac OS. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that image contains 
some Linux OS components and it's running on the on those Linux OS components on your uh, Mac? Yes, yes, basically, yes, exactly that. Um, most of the most of the images usually, even even though the ones that we import, like from from the Docker config file at the beginning, you have from Python. That from Python bit is Python installed in sort of like a Linux OS component bits, and then yeah. So th that's the beauty of containers, where you have that particular Linux code underneath there. And this particular person running Mac OS me in your in your example, I don't have to install anything because now it comes with its own components and the thing that it, that are required to run that particular code. And that's just going to run that. Kevin, if I can just yes. add on that. Uh, the what with the Docker engine, Docker engine is the same regardless of the operating system, whether you have a Mac OS, a Windows or a Linux. So once you just have Docker engine on your system, if you just get a an image from somewhere else and you just run it on top of Docker engine, it will just set up the container and everything for you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Gerard. Um, Zelalem, I think your question is answered, right? Yes. Cool. Um, Toyin, go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I think my question is for Azaria. Uh, from the example he showed us, he had, he had this uh, starter file where he, he wrote uh, app.py. What if it's not an application? Like, or is it only applications? That we, what if it's something like like this week, I think we are supposed to create a Docker image of what of the challenge this week, but we don't really have a starter file. Or do we have a starter file? Um, yeah, so like we're actually going to use Docker Compose uh, for it this week, and we're not going to be uh, making a web application, but like the individual components are um, like Kevin explained, the individual components are going to be um, talking to each other, like the Airflow container, um, the MySQL container. Um, if you're going to have an admin, uh, an administrator for the MySQL, like the PHP admin or the adminer container, um, all of these containers are going to be uh, working together. So um, we're not going to have a single Docker file on this week's challenge. Um, uh, but rather on the things that Kevin actually um, explained on. Oh, okay, thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Azaria. Um, yeah, any more questions? You guys don't have questions today. Oh, better cat. Yeah, like oh, one thing I have is uh, like we have Airflow that we have installed on using Docker Compose, and we have like other parts like dbt or something that we are working and if we contrast that one dbt also so how how come they are going to communicate that part is not clear for me come again that part like we we, we install airflow using docker compose like the mm -hmm. image for Airf uh, airflow and then we have uh like we install dbt and working on some files that we have in another folder which is not the same with Airflow, then mm -hmm. how are we? They go, going to communicate? Like, is there any file that will do that one? Or now, is, is there a way? Once, oh, okay. Um, the, the Docker Compose we is going to look into the particular folders that you have and check whether you have do you have the Docker comp the Docker files inside. Uh, let me reshare my screen. Right. Um, so, okay, um, can you guys see my screen? Yep, um, so we have, cool. Yeah. Um, now we have, for example, we have this particular, this is the API, this is the backend, and this is the web service. So in your case, it might be dbt, or it might be Airflow in that particular folder. You can see we specify that we say in this particular directory, build um, the API, the, the file in the API folder. So it's going to come into your folder here and see if you have a Docker file, then it's going to build that. And then 
after it has built that, you've already created uh, that particular image and it's running, you can link it using these particular links here. For example, you have links, .db and .storage. This just basically tells it to go and borrow from what we have here. And now with these particular components, you can use them inside, inside your container and the one that you have. Like you can sort of uh, give it instructions or as you've written your code, it knows, it now will know which particular ports and which particular, exactly, like now we have port. This, um, okay, so you, we all know Postgres runs in port 5432, right? And this is the port that you have here. And then the output port will be 1432. Now, once we've linked it here like this, it knows to look for the DB in this particular port. So you can say localhost, that particular port, and then it's going to fetch this particular port here. So you just have to define the ports and link it like this. And then after that, it's going to communicate with each other in your code, right? And does that answer your question, Berakat? Yeah, like uh, in here you have a Docker files somewhere yeah. like, uh, in each specific uh, folder. But yeah. when you when we install, it, it does have an effect whether it becomes Docker Compose. Like, um, what do you mean? Does it have an effect? Like when we when we install uh, Airflow, it creates a Docker Compose file. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like uh, we have also a Docker Compose outside that we want to communicate each image from other apps, like from another okay, folder you, that we have. You, you can Docker. remove the Docker Compose file inside the Airflow folder and then just have okay. one Docker Compose file that is before and then create a Docker file inside that Airflow. Okay, so I, I, like when I install the Airflow part, it will be the general one. Like I will use Docker Compose for that one and the others will have a Docker file. That you can work? just you can just change that particular Docker Compose file, or you can have that particular Docker Compose file in the Airflow as a major one. But I, I'd oh. rather you you define one for yourself so that you know which particular services you're using and how you can configure them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um. So Barak, I saw you had raised your hand. Yeah. Um. When you're talking about uh, the port, so. I want to understand, like, let's say you want the Docker to communicate, for example, my SQL. Are we just going mm -hmm. to change the port number to maybe, the, I think SQL port is 3306. So I'm just going to write 3306, mm -hmm. so I just show those now. So yeah, yeah, for example, um, let's say I can actually do this, right? Um, so we can say mm -hmm. here, instead of that, it's my SQL or container, whatever mm -hmm. you have. And then this particular port now is going to be 3306. And then you're not going to the port that you want your container to talk up to talk outside from will be here. Now you can define this port as anything as you want, but this is the port that you're going to to use in order to communicate to the MySQL image or the MySQL container. Okay. okay. That makes sense, right? Yes, yes. Cool. Yeah, any questions? Any more questions? Ah, okay, um, so I'm assuming that we don't have any more questions. If you don't have any questions, speak now or forever hold your questions. Um, yeah, if, if you have a question, feel free to at me on Rocket Chat or message me on Rocket Chat and then I'll help you from there. Uh, so you guys have a good Wednesday and have fun on the challenge as well. Always remember to have fun. So have fun. Cool. Bye. Okay, bye. Enjoy your Thursday. Yeah, you too, man.